really all over Europe, in every single country, from the biggest to the smallest, we're seeing a surge in support for nationalist and racist organizations and parties, um, which is an extremely important development and a very dangerous development from our point of view. If you just look at it, I won't mention all the countries, but in Germany, we have this <clears throat> racist and nationalist, German nationalist organization called the uh, AFD. They recently won the regional elections in Thuringia and in Brandenburg, in another region, they didn't quite win, but they came very close in, uh, in a very strong second position. They're now the biggest opposition party in the German parliament, in the Bundestag. In Spain, there's an organization called Vox, which again is a virulent nationalist and racist organization. They're the third largest force in the Spanish parliament today. In France, where I live, um, the Rassemblement National, I suppose you translate that as national rally, um, they got between 10 and 11 million votes in the last legislative elections. That's an awful lot of votes. And they are uh, also a major force in the French parliament as a result, and in fact, have a sort of controlling influence on the French government at the present time. In other words, without their support, the government it would likely fall. In, uh, and by the way, in the European elections, which is a, uh, an election with just one round, so you get quite a clear idea of the amount of support they have in the electorate, the RN, so the Rassemblement National, got 31.4%. That's one voter in three that voted for this racist and nationalist organisation. In Belgium, where the regional, national and European elections all took place uh, at the same time, we see the same surge uh, in support for the nationalists, both in the French-speaking part of Belgium and in the Flemish-speaking part of Belgium. In Austria, the Freedom Party, Again, the extreme right, nationalist right, got 28% of the vote. In Italy, we've actually got uh, Giorgia uh, Meloni in power. Uh, her party's called the Italian Fraternity or Brothers of Italy. Sweden, you've got the Swedish Democrats, as they call themselves, although they're not very democratic, um, who've made, uh, who are again, a bit like the RN in France, they're like a controlling power inside the parliament on a minority government. And in, in the Netherlands, you've got the growth of this movement around a guy called Wilders, who's virulently anti-Islam, I mean, anti-Muslim, I should say, uh, and uh, anti-immigration. And it's not just, I have to say, the growth of these nationalist parties, which is worrying, because a lot of the traditional right-wing parties, like Macron's party in France, have adopted many of the policies which we would associate with the extreme right. I mean, a couple of years ago, Macron introduced a law called the anti-separatism law, which basically stigmatized everyone in French society who wasn't really French. Uh, I'm talk, speaking from his, in his language. I mean, who is French? It's the people who live in France or the people who have French citizenship. But what he means by really French, he means non-Muslim, uh, um, white and you know with French sounding names and I can't go into detail on that law but basically there were all kinds of um, elements within this law which were basically uh, didn't really introduce any particularly new measures but what the law is saying is keep an eye on these people because they are uh, at least potentially a foreign body within French society and they're undermining our values, our traditions, our way of life, uh, and so on and so forth. So it was like a law, really a propaganda law, to incite hatred and suspicion uh, and contempt for a certain section of the population. So it's not just the Nationalist Party, there's a sort of contamination of right-wing parties, and I think the same is true of the Conservative Party in Britain, by these kind of nationalistic and racist ideas. So this is an extremely... Uh, serious development because what it means is that there's a growth in the what you might call the social base or the social basis of um, you know nationalist racist and also authoritarian ideas inside European society and if these uh, parties really uh, take control of uh, state power and governmental power then that will translate in terms of uh, vicious austerity policies, which we're used to in a number of countries already, but also uh, draconian uh, discriminatory policies against certain sections of the population, 
also increased repression, state repression, police repression. There again, Macron, you know, nice looking guy with a suit and tie and that he comes across as a very civilized fellow. He has reforms of the law in relation to policing in France, which basically gives the police a sort of shoot on sight, uh, you know, shoot to kill policy for anyone who, as the French say, refuses to obey. So this means if a policeman says, you know, shouts out to you that you have to stop in your car, you have to stop running, and you don't stop running, he can shoot to kill. And the and the criteria is if the policeman thinks that in, in your action, you are a potential danger either to him, the policeman, or to anyone else. So if you think you're driving away too fast, you might knock someone over and kill them, mind you not. So you can be shot at and killed by the French police. So this is, and, and yet the RN, the Rassemblement National, they say that these kind of repressive measures, these special powers for the police, don't go far enough. So we can imagine what kind of policies they would put in if they got into power. So it's an extremely uh, dangerous situation we're in because either these parties are in power, as they are in Italy uh, and in other places, or they're sort of on the threshold in, of power and could come to power over the next few years. So <clears throat> the first question which comes to my mind is why is this happening? Why is it happening now? Um, how is it to be explained? You know, is it just a question of race or racial prejudice? And if it is, then why all of a sudden have we got this upsurge, you know, of, so, of just so many millions of people suddenly be, can, being converted to racist ideas? Or is it something that runs deeper than that? I mean, in a way, you could say that racism has been with us for centuries. It goes back uh, and even perhaps beyond that to the colonial era, where the populations of the so-called great nations, the imperialist nations, Britain, France, Germany, and what have you, they were brought up in the spirit of, you know, what makes our country great, what makes our country rich, is that we've conquered Africa, we've conquered Asia, we've conquered Latin America, we've conquered the poor peoples, the underdeveloped parts of the world, and we therefore have a natural right to their resources, to their labour, you know, their labour power, and so on. This was the way imperialism tried to educate the working people of uh, in, in their own countries, that greatness came through the pillage and exploitation of the weak. But, you know, I think that the surge in nationalism at the present time is not just a question of racism. If you ask many people, you know, well, why do you support the, the National Front or why do you support these things? Many of them will say quite clearly that they're not racist, that they don't have any uh, problem with, you know, um, for foreigners, as they call them, or the people of different colours, different religions, different nationalities. And they're quite sincere in that, many of them. It's not just a question of blind racial hatred. The fact of the matter is that people, honest people, many of them, are just looking for solutions. And they can't see any solutions in the old order of things, that is to say, parliamentary democracy, as it is set up now, or in the way left and right parties have managed their governments over recent decades. And there's really like a fear for themselves, for their future, for the future of their children, and a general feeling that society is not going in the right direction, that in many ways society is going backwards. And that creates a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear and anxiety. And, you know, there's a fear of uh, there's poverty in society. I'll give you some statistics about French society, and I'm sure it's a very similar position that you have in Britain. <clears throat> But there is poverty, but there's also the fear of poverty, or at any rate, the feeling that, you know, people will all feel that their social status, their standing in society, their position is under threat and they're sort of in danger of going down, of slipping down a few rungs on the ladder. There's a fear of what we call de declassment, I think is the word. Um, and maybe that's a literal translation from French. But anyway, I'll give you some ideas about... Uh, poverty in France. In France, we've got 9 million people who are officially living under the poverty line, or living under the official poverty line. What that amounts to is 14.4% of the population living in, you know, who literally can't pay the rent, can't feed their families properly. So on. Um, that poverty line, what is it? For a single person, uh, it's considered to be 1,158 euros per person. You've got to bear in mind that the minimum wage in France is just a little bit more than that, a couple of hundred euros more than that. So the minimum wage, which a lot of people are on, millions of people, it's just above 
the poverty line. So 14.4% of the population. But then if you take families with three children or more, it's not 14.4%, but 26% of the population, that's more than a quarter of families with three children who are living in poverty. That's a tremendous chunk of society. And uh, also 14% of the self-employed. I don't know, but when I was younger, someone who was self-employed, you sort of thought of him as being a, a cut above your wage worker. You know, he had some independence. He had his, in a way, he had his own little business. 14% of them not only not getting on very well, but actually living in poverty. And it's not just about monetary poverty. What I mean by that is not, you know, an insufficient income to feed your family. On top of that, and I think this is a general situation throughout Europe, you've got um, housing conditions which are deteriorating. It's more and more difficult for people on low incomes to get proper housing, you know, that isn't damp or isn't, you know, dilapidated and so on. There's access to public services. I don't know what it's like in Britain, but in France, where you've got these rural areas or small villages and small towns, you know, there's no stores, there's no pharmacy anymore, you can't find a doctor. They keep consolidating local hospitals into these mega giant hospitals, which people have to travel, you know, scores of miles to get to. So there's a, a, a problem of getting medical care uh, in good time. There's an insufficiency of public transport which is a factor in poverty, because of how do you get a job if you don't have a car and you can't get to work? So it limits the possibilities people have to find work. And there's the question of the quality of schools, because even though on the face of it, we have an egalitarian school system where the government you know, distributes teachers according to the needs in schools, and you know, on, in theory, all schools should be of a similar quality, the truth of the matter is, that in poor areas, the schools are not so good. I don't think I need to explain to you why, because the schools have to, you know, take on board all the problems within society of poverty, of social demoralization, of drugs, of alcoholism, delinquency, all the rest of it. All that is sort of fed into the schools and affects the quality of schooling. So this fear, this idea of a sort of general decline and a precarity, a kind of... Uh, uncertainty about the future is a real problem, I would say, for the mass of the population, not just for the poorest, but even people who would consider themselves a sort of middle class or doing quite nicely for themselves. They're worried about the future because of the general drift which society is taking at the present time. And what's happening there is that nationalist propaganda feeds into that and in its crudest form, it takes the, it's the idea that if there were less foreigners or if we only had the real French in France or the real English in England or British in Britain, then everyone, you know, we would be better off. That's in its crudest form. But, you know, I, I, the reason why I'm talking about these social conditions is because I don't think personally that what has um, created this nationalistic and xenophobic mood in society, which is this growing social base, is just about the propaganda of a few racist politicians. It must be more than that. <clears throat> It's being created, and I'll try and explain to you what I think it's being created by, but it's being created by uh, powerful social and economic forces which are at work on a world scale and which are creating this kind of psychology and this, this kind of shift in consciousness towards nationalism. So in its crudest form, I mean, when I first started, you know, as an activist in in British politics when I was 17 and 18, my idea of racism was, well... What the racists say is um, if there's not enough houses, if there's not enough decent jobs, if there's not enough beds in hospitals, if there's not enough uh, you know, places in nurseries, in other words, if there's a shortage of things, then it's because there are too many foreigners. And if we got rid of the foreigners, then there'd be more for the rest of us. And I think that's a, an important element of basic crude racist propaganda. And to some people in society, you know, who haven't thought much about politics, perhaps... <coughs> you know, not particularly educated, this seems like an unassailable argument, you know. If there were less people, then there'd be more for the others, there'd be more to go around. Um, but, you know, obviously that's not an, an idea we would accept. So, but it's quite a powerful idea in society, this, and what it is basically, it's divide and rule. Don't look at capitalism, don't look at who's really in control of society, don't look at who's got the power, 
and the money in society. Look at the poor guy next door who happens to be Muslim, who happens to be black, who happens to be whatever. He's the problem. So take it out on your neighbor, take it out on your brothers and sisters, if you like. I'm talking, you know, fellow workers, fellow working people. And don't look at the real people, the people who are really responsible for these social problems in society. And, you know, uh, I've spoken to quite a few people who, again, aren't racist and are often like their families were migrants at one point, like two or three generations back. And they'll say to you, is it reasonable in a society where there's like uh, two or three million unemployed, where there's poverty, where our hospitals are going to the dogs, where you can't find places in nurseries and so on and so forth? Is it reasonable for us to take in more and more people? Shouldn't we re-establish frontiers and get some control over the situation? And a lot of people think like that. It's a powerful idea. And we have to find a way of answering that. But I do think that apart from this kind of basic divide and rule and question of allocation of resources, as I said before, there are other powerful forces at work which are kind of shaping psychology in society and and you know bringing about this shift in consciousness towards nationalist uh, ideas and fear of foreigners so let's try and understand what is going on i think in some senses you could say that nationalism is a reaction to globalization and the consequences of globalization you could perhaps call globalization capitalist internationalism and that has brought about winners, the rich, the powerful, the Elon Musks of this world, you know, the Bill Gates and so on. But it's also brought about losers. And many people, most people, are the losers as a result of this, this glo capitalist glo globalization. What worries people? And it's not, you know, these aren't just um, fanciful ideas. What worries people is that free competition, where our economies are exposed to the four winds of foreign competition, trade in all directions, foreign goods coming in, sweeping away our national industries, uh, foreign workers coming in, and perhaps uh, taking jobs which we might have had, uh, free movement of labor, in other words, free trade, finance swirling around the world's stock exchanges and so on that nobody seems to control. There's this feeling that nobody is really controlling what's going on. And don't we need to get some sort of control back and get the world economy into smaller, more manageable units? Because let's face it, for decades now, every time you said to a politician or, you know, some of these experts, well, why have we carried out this policy? Why are we privatizing health? You know, why are we... Uh, selling off council houses why uh you know why are we uh have we got these dead-end jobs and so on like delivering pizzas and so on instead of real professions and things like that and i'll say it's not us it's the european union or it's not us it's decisions taken in china or it's taken in new york or it's you know globalization you've just got to accept it in other words they pass the book they put it on the back of the world economy and so it's not surprising that many working people draw the conclusion, well, are you saying there's nothing can be done about our fate here in Britain or our fate here in France? It's all this kind of, the, you know, what, it, what was the expression? The, uh, the, something like the unseen hand of the world economy, you know. You can't, um, you know, who's, who's in control, actually? Even the big capitalists, you know, they say, we can't control the fluctuation in world markets and things like this. So it's natural that there's this reaction against globalization of saying, we need to have governments that can decide what goes on in this country and have some control over our economy, over our society, and are answerable to our people, instead of just saying it's beyond us, you know, we can't control what goes on in the world economy. So as I say, there are winners and losers, and there are more losers and winners in this uh, globalization of the world economy. And let's take one example of this uh, international capitalist economy, and that's the European Union. I know that Britain voted out of the European Union, and I actually think, you know, there might have been different reasons why people did that. But it, what it denotes, in my view, is that in Britain also there was this kind of undercurrent of retreat into, you know, national identity, wanting to get Britain back for the Britons. That was a, a large element, I think, in the Brexit vote. But, um, you know, if you take the European Union, what did it promise? I mean, I remember when there was the... Uh, the Maastricht Treaty was being discussed. Do you remember? I don't know when that was, in the middle of the 1990s, was it, or something like that? 
What was the propaganda of the European <clears throat> Union? If we all join together, and if we have a single currency, and we uh, eliminate the borders, we have free movement of trade and goods and people you know, within the European Union, there will be a general increase in living standards, there will be peace, and look, we've got a, a huge and horrible war just uh, you know, in southeastern Europe at the present time. There'll be peace, there'll be stability, there'll be increased living standards. And they even talked about a peace dividend. In other words, there'll be less expenditure on arms because Europe would be a more powerful force in the world and a force for peace and all this. And the money which was spent on arms can now will now be able to be spent on health, education, housing, on the general well-being of the population. The European Union, in fact, has done the exact opposite on all these questions and is seen as largely responsible for, you know, this decline in, in living standards. You know, decisions are taken in Brussels, just as they were taken, you know, in New York or China, that the national governments say, well, we didn't decide this, this is the European Union. But who's the European Union? It's representatives of all the governments. They're just in a different place. You know, they send the Ministry of the Economy to Brussels, he votes for something, it's applied, and then he comes back to his home country and says, it's not me, it's Brussels. It's like a game, it's like a waltz, you know, of changing seats and so on, and just fobbing off responsibility for what they're doing. And, you know, the European Union has also, as part of the globalisation of the capitalist economy, it's swept away entire industries. I mean, why is it, for instance, that uh, some of the bastions of the RN, you know, the Rassemblement National, is in the north of France and the east of France, where there used to be huge steelworks and mines and heavy industry? Why is it in areas like Saint-Denis, where there used to be, you know, heavy industry? Or to the southwest of Paris, where there used to be a car plant, a Renault car plant, which employed something like 40,000 people? It's gone. And so... Uh, some of these industries just uproot and they go off, I don't know, to Romania or whatever because wages are lower and they can make more profits. And so, you know, there's this resentment against the European Union as well as part of this resentment against these, you know, uh, as I say, like all, all the different forces in, uh, in the world economy, which no one seems to be able to control. And so there again, it's not surprising that there's this feeling We've got to get things back. The nation, if you like, it should be like they see it as a sort of a refuge. The nation should have control over what happens within our national entity, within our within our country. And what that means is keep out uh, foreign labour, prevent you know the movement of free movement of people looking for jobs in different countries. It means protectionism in relation to trade. You know, don't let foreign goods in, which are going to sweep away our national industries and things like that. And so, you know, I think this nationalism, it's not just about racism, it's about, um, uh, they see it as an answer to this feeling of powerlessness, of vulnerability, which everybody feels in some way or other. I mean, if you're in involved in politics in any way, and you, you know, you talk to people in the streets when you're giving out leaflets, or you talk, even talk to people on demonstrations or on our side, you can feel that anxiety, and you can feel that worry about the future, that things are really going in the wrong direction. And that's really, I think, what has created this surge in national sentiment and sort of opened people up to the kind of propaganda which the uh, RN and these other nationalist organisations are feeding with them, I mean, them with. And reform is a, a similar movement in, in Britain. I mean, you know that more about that than I do. So it's like a sort of refuge where people think it's a psychological thing, you know, they want, they want to find familiarity again. They want things that they know, people that speak their own language, what they imagine used to be the traditions of our families and the way things were in the past. Can't we free ourselves from, you know, international market forces and get some sort of control over, over things? And it's the illusion that if we're all in the same nation, then we've got some sort of shared purpose, which isn't true. You know, I've got far more in common with French, German, Dutch, whatever, you know, Chinese workers as a work, you know, as someone who works, than I have with capitalists from Britain or France. You know, the, the, we're not a national family. There are class divisions within society, antagonisms within society. We can't have equality between exploiters and exploited. You know, all these societies are divided, and my position has always been that what counts is uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, is solidarity of people of our own social condition, as opposed to that class of all-powerful people 
who are responsible for exploiting us, not just in our own countries, but these multinationals are exploiting people all over the world. You know, I've often thought the capitalists aren't racist. You know, they'll exploit you whatever your color is or whatever your nationality is. They're not bothered. And so it's a question of solidarity among working people as against the capitalists. But um, that's not the way people think of it. They think, you know, if we just got France back for the French, or as they, what they see as the French. Well, in reality, of course, France, like Britain, is a multicultural society. And Macron goes on and on about French traditions, French values, the French this, the French that. Who are the French? Well, there's millions of Muslims in France. They're French. They're every bit as French as anyone else. You know, that's France. But he's trying to divide people by saying there are some that are really French and some that have sort of been <laughs> insinuated their way into French society and they shouldn't really be here. And, of course, there's all this other propaganda, which I'm sure you have in other countries where uh, delinquency, crime, you know, <laughs> all kinds of skullduggery in society is sort of linked in some way or other to foreign populations. Well, let's just admit for one second that that's true, that there are social problems as a result of, you know, these ghettos of concentrations of, uh, let's say, families which came out of uh, migrations in the past, because many of them are not migrants themselves, they're the grandchildren of migrants. Let's just admit that that's the case. What about the ravages of French capitalism in Africa? You know, where they're poisoning the rivers, where they're poisoning the children, where, you know, the, you, people can't get fresh water. You get these huge companies making millions, what am I saying, billions of euros out of exploiting the resources of Africa. Where's that money going? It's not going to the African people. So, you know, whatever problems might be caused by so-called immigration in Europe, I'll tell you, it's nothing. It's peanuts compared to the consequences of the actions of British, French, American, Russian, Chinese capitalism in, uh, in, in continents like, uh, you know, in, in Africa and elsewhere. You know, the one other aspect of this surge in uh, nationalism, there's another dimension to it, and that is sort of uh, openness or a tolerance or even a desire for more authoritarian governments. Now, you get these politicians in France, you know, on the left, and say, oh, you know, we have to defend democracy we must uh, keep parliamentary democracy. It's very important. I mean, it's a very democratic country. And listen to her and listen to him. The way they talk, you know, the, the authoritarian figures, this is very bad. I'll tell you, people who are desperate, they don't really care about that. What they want is solutions. And look at democracy. I mean, you again, you know the British situation better than I do, but I'll tell you something. In France, it's a sort of commonly held idea by almost everyone that politicians are mainly in politics to fill their own pockets, to look after their own interests. They're getting money off lobbyists. They're getting money, uh, you know, getting wined and dined. They're getting sent on foreign trips. You know, what? we Even could build a nice tramway for you. If you want to see a tramway, one of the ones we built, go on a holiday to, you know, some far off country. Hotels, wine, women, song. What did you think of the tramways we built over there? Wouldn't you like to build one in your town? This is the way it went. Everybody knows that. So capitalist democracy, as it is now, is corrupt. It's corrupt. And when you say to people, well, she's a bit authoritarian, she might sort of lift herself above the parliament, not take notice of what the members of parliament say and sort of decree this measure and decree that measure. No, you know, that doesn't matter that much because people see that the present system, the present form of democracy is not working. I mean, they, uh, I'll give you just one little example. Senators, so it's like the, the upper chamber of the French parliament, and members of parliament that are on very high wages. They get these allocations for, in case you need uh, to pay for, you know, office expenses, or you need employees. They give them a massive amount of money. It's, uh, it's more than their wage as an MP. Whether they spend it or not, it's like it's like theirs, you know. You can spend it or not, you can employ someone or not, but you still get that money. One time, many years ago, you know, I went to the dentist and I had a good uh, insurance cover with the company I worked for. So I got social security and then they paid, my company paid anything over that. And the dentist said to me, wow, this you've got good cover, you know, this is going to cost you nothing, this dental treatment. And she said... Uh, it's not quite as good as the senators and the members of parliament now, because they got an allocation for dental treatment. If they went to the dentist, they got money, you know, to pay for the dental fee, which was higher than what it cost. So they, they got, and the more often you go to the dentist, the more money you earn. I mean, this is just ludicrous. And they get pensions and things like that. And the same members of parliament who are saying we need to cut pensions, we need to keep down health costs, 
we, you know, we need to close hospitals. We can't afford nurses and this kind of thing. They're all right, Jack. You know, they're very nice. But people know that. So it's not surprising that given this feeling that we need to get some control over society, they're prepared to tolerate strong men or strong women who say, this is what is going to happen. And it doesn't matter what the members of parliament think. You see what I mean? It's like a, a psychological answer to what they see as all these politicians poncing around, talking, you know, making fancy speeches in parliament and nothing happens, or at least nothing good happens. So democracy is discredited and it's not surprising that, that authoritarianism has, is gaining ground. And what the nationalists do, you know, you, you've heard this term populism. Well, what's populism? It's flattering the common people by saying, you are the people, you are the nation. And these people are the elites and they're kind of mobilizing the people against the elites. And, you know, what people understand to be the elites are the politicians, is what they, in France they call it, the, the political class. You know, the people who really have the power, who have a voice, who are on TV, who make the decisions. And they try to give people the impression that if they were in power, they would take measures or they would bypass the elites and really look after the people. So this, again, is our very potent propaganda. And when people say to themselves, you know, well, who's going to protect us? Who can protect us? Who can help us? Can the trade unions help us? Well, they've been around a long time. They haven't really solved much. Can the left parties protect us? Well, they've also been in government from time to time and they haven't done much for us. So what comes to mind in people, you know, to, in people's thinking is the only thing that can protect us really is the state, is the government. <coughs> and it needs to be a strong government and it needs to be a government that has real control over society. So that's, in my view, is the sort of mainspring of this authoritarian trend which we see in politics. So <clears throat> just to conclude, you know, one other mainspring, and it's a sad thing to say, of this surge in nationalistic ideology, is related to this question of who can protect us, who can defend us, who will solve the problem. And this brings me to a really vital point in this discussion, and that is the role and the history, the practice of left parties like the Labour Party in Britain, like the Socialist Party in France, or the Communist Party, for that matter. You know, we've got a Communist Party in France, which I'm a member of. The last time they were in power, they privatised, the, the, that government carried out more privatisations than any previous right-wing government. For instance, you had a Communist Minister of Transport who privatised Air France. He also privatised the highways, you know, the, the motorways. Well, what kind of communism is that, you know? So when workers have seen left governments come to power, making all kinds of promises, and then doing the opposite to what they promised, then that has discredited the left. You know, there was one half-decent left government in France, that was in 1981, under François Mitterrand. When he was elected as president, and the socialists and communists had a massive majority, both in the Senate and in the, in the parliament, in the National Assembly, they carried out a whole avalanche of social reforms. They increased the minimum wage, they, increased, they improved pensions, they reduced the working week. They uh, gave new rights and guarantees to trade union organizations. They uh, promised, they never carried it out, but they promised to give voting rights to uh, um, migrants. In fact, they did carry it out, but just in local elections, not in national elections. In other, they carried out a whole lot of social reforms. They abolished the death penalty, what you might say, that only concerns a very small minority in society. They abolished the death penalty. They carried out a whole series of uh, social reform. And what happened? Big business in France, they said, oh yeah, you're messing us around. You're increasing taxes on profits. You're forcing us to pay higher wages for workers. You're forcing us to reduce the working week, which cuts into our profits again. Well, we've got power. So capital began to leave the country at an incredible rate. Investment projects were cancelled. Factories were closed or moved abroad. In other words, they had the government by the throat. And within something like nine to 12 months, the Mitterrand government, which was a socialist and communist coalition, ended the reforms, said there'd be no more of this for a stop because the, the big business had them by the throat. And they started to carry out measures in the opposite direction. That's when they closed down the steelworks and the, the coal mines, and they started to scaled down the uh, the car industry, the automobile industry, and made a lot of industries like that. And that's what kind of created a bedrock on which the National Front, as it was at the time, started to develop. But that was the best experience we've had when the socialists were in power. The next time, again, with the Communist Party, that was between 1997 and, 19, uh, and 2001, 
That was when they privatized massively. Nobody, no other government in the history of France has privatized as much industry. I think it was 31 billion euros worth of public assets were passed over to private businesses. So <clears throat> that's an important lesson because when people say, how can we defend ourselves? Who's on our side? Really, they discount the left because the left's had its chance, not once, not twice, but many times, and it hasn't solved the problems. And I'll tell you something, in Britain, you got this Mr. What's his name? Starmer in power. <laughs> okay. Is he a socialist? Is he going to defend the working people? What's he going to do? He's going to do like I was saying. He'll look after himself and he'll carry out measures. Overall, he might do this, give this and that sop to working people here and there. But overall, his policy will be a capitalist policy. It'll favor the rich and it'll disfavor the poor. And not just the poor, I mean, those people who can't live, but, you know, people in general. And if that happens, this reform party you've got, which, is, you know, didn't get a huge vote, but it got a very significant vote, but it's on the threshold. You might find, as we're going to find in France, I think, I hope I'm wrong, but I think Marine Le Pen will probably win the next presidential election. You might find that reform starts to really take on weight and might even come to power in Britain over the next period if Labour, you know, does the dirty on, on the mass of the population in order to curry favour with the business. So the reason I'm saying that is because if we want to fight against racism, we want to fight against nationalism, on the one hand, we've got to understand the root causes of why there is this surge in nationalist sentiment and nationalist ideology, which is why I tried to you know, develop those points. But it has to be linked to a struggle to rearm the labour movement with genuine socialist policies, which really defend the interests of the working people. Now, just a word on that. Let's just imagine that I am wrong, that Le Pen doesn't win the next elections and that the elections are won by the coalition of the left, which they call now the New Popular Front. It's basically the New Popular Front, the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, and this left party, which is called, in French, it's La France Insoumise, which means um, unsubdued France or rebellious France, if you like. Okay, it's a left party. It's like a socialist party. They've got a coalition. They've got an alliance. Let's say they win. They might, I don't know, because it'll be Le Pen and then it'll be the popular front probably in the second in the second round. It'll be a playoff between the two. Let's hope that a lot of people get frightened at the idea of a, an RN government and they vote for the left. Let's say. What's their policy? It's quite a good policy. <clears throat> they want to impose higher taxes on the rich. They want to improve wages. They want to refinance all the public services. They've got a policy for improving the environment and, you know, you know in, fighting against pollution and so on. They got a, what, you know, if you look down the list of their program, it's an excellent program. It would, if it was applied, it would tend to seriously improve the conditions of working people. So that's a good thing. Those are reforms of, of, of the kind we want to see. But we've already seen with Mitterrand in 1981, and that's going to be the same thing this time. If big business has to face a, a popular front government trying to <coughs> improve the conditions of workers at the expense of the big capitalists who run society, they will respond to that in the same way as they responded in 1981. So when I say a genuine socialist policy, I mean one which can actually be applied. And how could it be applied? You know, if, if you had left leaders who said, as Mitterrand should have done. He, what should he have done, Mitterrand? He should have turned to the French people and said, well, look, we put forward a program of social reform to improve your living conditions. We tried sincerely to apply that policy, as he did. But in society, there's a tiny minority of all powerful people who've got so much control over society, over our lives, over the state, over everything, that they, in their own interests, can sabotage and destroy that policy and force a left government, an elected, democratically elected left government, to carry out policies in their interests. And therefore, the left proposes to remove that power from the capitalist class by a program of nationalization, socialization, call it what you like. It means take the economic power off the capitalist class and put it in the public domain under the democratic control of society. That's what socialism is, as far as I'm concerned. And that's why what we need to fight nationalism is to present people with a policy which, first of all, will explain why previous left governments have failed, because they didn't have that policy of expropriating the capitalists, and also carries out the sort of links a policy of social reform to a policy of transforming society in a more democratic uh, you know, form of society, socialism, 
which really means that the state, the economy, that all the um, all the levers of power within society are under the democratic control of the people. I think if we had that, then that would put the ground under the feet of the nationalists and open the way for a better future for everybody.